on World News Tonight. Mayan menace. Thousands surrounding Philippines' most active volcano have been evacuated. Catastrophic losses. Putin asserts that Ukraine suffered catastrophic losses in new counter-offensive. Trump's indictment. Trump pleads not guilty to alleged charges of mishandling of classified documents. Reflecting Rio. Rio de Janeiro launches digital exhibition to pay homage to nature. This is Ada Derna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. A very good evening and you are watching World News Tonight. We start off in the Philippines. Tens of thousands of people who live near the nation's most active volcano have been evacuated. Many of them are villagers who live in poor farming communities. Lava has been flowing from the Mayan volcano and there are concerns of a larger eruption. Lava spews down its slopes. The Philippines' most volatile volcano, the Mayon, now in full flow. The first fires emerged late on Sunday evening after a week of increased activity. Thousands of people living in a six-kilometer radius from the crater have been evacuated. We had this feeling that our end is near. Most of those who have fled have lived in these farming villages for generations, making this departure particularly hard. It's difficult to be displaced from your home. We left behind our livestock and we don't know how we will provide for our daily needs. There's a new sense of fear and suffering as toxic fumes engulf the region. For Amelia Morales, it's the second tragedy she's had to contend with in a matter of days, holding a wake for her late husband amidst the chaos. It's really very difficult because we don't have any money. My own acting up and then my husband died and now we are stuck in the evacuation center. But there remains an unspecified number of people choosing to stay behind even in areas long declared off limits and at great risk. Seismologists warn the eruption could turn violent, evoking memories of five years ago at the same spot when tens of thousands were displaced. South Korean President Yoon suk yeol stated that he was doubtful whether China's ambassador had an attitude of mutual respect as local media reported that South Korea is pivoting towards a hard-line stance in its relations with Beijing. The presidential office says that it's waiting for China to take appropriate measures in response to remarks made by the Chinese ambassador to South Korea, Xin Haiming who last week said that it would be wrong for Seoul to bet on Beijing's defeat, apparently criticizing Seoul's foreign policy leaning towards the U.S. A senior official from the top office said in a press briefing on Tuesday afternoon that South Korea has been saying it will form a healthy relationship with China, based on mutual respect and reciprocity. But the Chinese top envoy has made remarks that sound as if this policy is aimed at excluding a certain country. The official also added that a diplomat's role is to focus on boosting relations and abide by the Vienna Convention. Under Article 41 of the Vienna Convention, diplomats must respect the laws of the receiving state, and that it's also their duty not to interfere in the internal affairs of that state. President Yoon also reportedly told officials that the Chinese ambassador's recent move was diplomatically inappropriate. During a closed-door cabinet meeting, he also said that the South Korean public is displeased. The White House also weighed in, saying that South Korea is a sovereign, independent nation that has the right to make foreign policy decisions that it deems appropriate. The U.S. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said it appears as if there was some sort of pressure tactic being used. Experts say that South Korea needs to take strong action, but at the same time, it should not turn its back on China. We have to protest and take strong measures against Xin's diplomatic rude remarks. But separately, we also need to work under the table so that relations with China do not get worse. Either by sending a special envoy or through other channels, we should not let relations with China go downhill. But both countries have yet to find a way to settle the situation, and it appears that the ongoing diplomatic conflict will not be resolved soon. Police and other experts are tracking a small but rising number of cases in neo-Nazism in Brazil that have increased as far-right politics flourished during the term of former President Jair Bolsonaro. This is the flag of an alleged Brazilian neo-Nazi group 
called Crew 38. It, along with other items seized by police, serve as stark visual reminders of a small but rising number of neo-Nazism cases in the country. The uptick comes amid the flourishing of far-right politics during former President Jair Bolsonaro's term. Police detective Arthur Lopez's team carried out a bust against Crew 38 last year. He works in Santa Catarina, a state where neo-Nazism is believed to be particularly acute. I think the most serious case is that of Hammerskins. I don't think we expected to find such a well-structured and rooted group on Brazilian soil with so many connections around the world. Police are also looking into another case in the state involving an anonymous email sent before a gathering for Haitian immigrants threatening a massacre if it wasn't called off. The event went ahead with police there and without any issues. Brazil's federal police have 21 probes on the go into the alleged manufacture, sale, distribution or brandishing of swastikas for the purpose of propagating Nazism. There was just one in 2018. That's the year Bolsonaro was elected. He's been criticized for defending Brazil's military dictatorship and attacking the country's voting systems. While Brazil's racism law punishes the use of symbols linked to Nazism, Lopez says it's tricky to prosecute, as symbols beyond the swastika often go unpunished. Former U.S. President Donald Trump pleads not guilty to federal criminal charges that he unlawfully kept national security documents when he left office and lied to officials who sought out to recover them. Former President Donald Trump sat in a courtroom Tuesday to face charges against him for the second time in a little over two months. He pleaded not guilty to 37 criminal charges that he unlawfully kept national security documents when he left office and lied to officials who sought to recover them. Wearing a blue suit and a red tie, Trump frowned and leaned back in his chair but did not speak during the 47-minute hearing, which was closed to cameras. I think it's a rigged deal here. We have a rigged country. We have a country that's corrupt. It was a contrast to later in the afternoon when Trump appeared more spirited as he met with supporters and staff at a Cuban restaurant in Miami in an unexpected stop after his arraignment. Trump was allowed to leave court without conditions or travel restrictions, and no cash bond was required. The judge in the case also ruled that he was not allowed to communicate with potential witnesses. It sets up a long legal battle as Trump, the frontrunner for the Republican presidential nomination, campaigns to win back the presidency in a November 2024 election. Experts say it could be a year or more before a trial takes place. Trump's spokesperson and lawyer, Alina Haba, called Trump defiant and the prosecution by the Justice Department politically motivated. Trump has repeatedly proclaimed his innocence and accused Democratic President Joe Biden's administration of targeting him. He called special counsel Jack Smith, who is leading the prosecution, a Trump hater on social media on Tuesday. Smith accuses Trump of risking national secrets by taking thousands of sensitive papers with him when he left the White House in January 2021 and storing them in a haphazard manner at his Mar-a-Lago, Florida estate and his New Jersey golf club, according to a grand jury indictment released last week. Photos included in the indictment show boxes of documents stored on a ballroom stage, in a bathroom, and strewn across a storage room floor. The charges include violations of the Espionage Act, which criminalizes unauthorized possession of defense information, and conspiracy to obstruct justice, which carries a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison. That is the maximum sentence he faces, as he would serve any sentences concurrently if convicted. Legal experts say the evidence amounts to a strong case, and Smith has said Trump will have a speedy trial. Outside the courthouse, a small crowd of Trump supporters cheer as he came and went, while others expressed their opposition to the former president and his actions. Trump's former aide, Walt Nada, also faces charges in the documents case. Tuesday marked the second courtroom appearance for Trump this year. In April, he pleaded not guilty to state charges in New York stemming from a hush money payment to a porn star. 
Russian President Vladimir Putin stated that for now he saw no need for a new mobilization of fighting men to confront the Ukrainian counteroffensive launched last week, but he didn't rule out trying again to take Kiev. Russia's President Vladimir Putin claimed on Tuesday Ukraine's counteroffensive had so far failed, saying without providing evidence that Ukrainian forces had suffered catastrophic casualties. Russian state TV broadcast Putin speaking to war reporters and military bloggers at the Kremlin in some of his widest ranging remarks since the invasion of Ukraine. During the several hours of questioning, he was shown claiming Ukraine had lost 25 to 30 percent of military vehicles supplied by Western countries and that its human losses were 10 times higher than Russia's, was unable to immediately verify his assertions. Putin did acknowledge that Russia needed to strengthen its defences against attacks on its own territory and warned he may need to impose a so-called sanitary zone inside Ukraine to prevent such attacks. And if this continues, then we will have to consider the possibility, I say this very carefully, of creating some kind of buffer zone on Ukrainian territory to the kind of distance from which it would be impossible to reach our territory. When Putin ordered Russian forces into Ukraine in February last year, one of their first acts was to try to capture the capital, Kyiv, which they failed to do so. Putin did not rule out a second attempt to take the city, saying it was only him who could answer the question. He did add, however, that there was no need for a further mobilization of men to fight, for now. Russian forces are currently battling Ukrainian soldiers along a 600-mile front line, well away from the capital. Ukraine says it will never rest until every Russian soldier is ejected from its land. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. Welcome back. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said that Ukraine is making progress in its counteroffensive against so called Russian invaders and predicted NATO leaders will increase military assistance to Kyiv when they meet next month. In a visit to Washington, D.C., the head of the NATO alliance on Tuesday hailed Ukrainian forces for what he said was progress in a counteroffensive against Russian invaders. And the support that uh, we are providing together to Ukraine is now making a difference uh, on the battlefield as we speak. Because the offensive is launched and Ukrainians are making progress, uh, uh, making advances. Uh, it's still early days, uh, but what we do know is that the more land Ukrainians are able to liberate, um, uh, the, 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 the stronger hand they will have at the negotiating table. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg met with U.S. President Joe Biden in the Oval Office. He said he expected NATO members to commit further arms and support to Kyiv at an upcoming summit in Lithuania in July. Uh, and that's exactly what we'll do when we meet uh, all the NATO leaders at the summit in Vilnius uh, next month where we agree to sustain and step up our support to Ukraine, further strengthen our uh, deterrence and defense. The NATO chief's visit comes amid questions about how much longer he'll stay on the job. Stoltenberg has held the post for nine years, and his term is set to end in September. Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year touched off what might be the greatest challenge to the NATO military alliance since the end of the Cold War, one Stoltenberg seems to have faced without wavering. We believe uh, the uh, uh, Secretary General has done a fantastic job, a really wonderful job during this difficult time, this history-making time with the war in Ukraine being one of them, and how NATO has come together. NATO countries have contributed billions in military hardware to Kyiv, and Stoltenberg has since welcomed Finland as the 31st member of the pact, with Sweden apparently set to join soon. Many NATO members would like a decision on who will head the alliance when leaders meet in Lithuania. Stoltenberg did not answer questions when asked whether his tenure would be extended. A group of U.S. lawmakers called to move a U.S.-Africa summit from South Africa to a different host over Russia ties. Solensburg is set to host the meeting of the African Growth and Opportunity Act, a U.S. investment and trade program in sub-Saharan Africa. 
A group of lawmakers in the United States is calling for a U.S.-Africa trade summit to be moved from South Africa. That's in response to what they described as the country's deepening military relationship with Russia. South Africa hosted joint naval exercises with Russia and China earlier this year. It also plans to host a summit of leaders from the BRICS group of nations. Russian President Vladimir Putin is invited, despite being subject to an arrest warrant issued by the International Criminal Court. In the letter to US Secretary of State Antony Blinken and other senior officials, the lawmakers suggested South Africa is in danger of losing its benefits under the African Growth and Opportunity Act, or AGOA. That's Washington's flagship trade program. It grants qualifying countries' exports preferential access to the US. Johannesburg is due to host the AGOA Forum later this year. African nations will be seeking to extend the program, scheduled to expire in 2025. South Africa's exports to the US under AGOA reached nearly $1 billion in the first three months of this year, making it the second biggest beneficiary after Nigeria. In the US letter, dated June 9th, lawmakers said they were seriously concerned that hosting the summit in South Africa would serve as an implicit endorsement of South Africa's damaging support for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. South Africa has declared its neutrality in the Ukraine conflict, which Russia calls a special military operation. However, the letter also appeared to back up an accusation by the US ambassador to South Africa that a sanctioned Russian vessel collected weapons at a South African naval base last year. South African officials say they are not aware of such an arms transfer and have launched an independent inquiry. Referring to the letter, South African Foreign Ministry spokesman Clayson Monyela said on Twitter, there is no decision by the State Department slash White House to move the AGOA Forum from SA. South Africa's Department of Trade and Industry said it was not planning to respond publicly to the letter. The U.S. State Department stated that Sudan's warring fractions are not taking advantage of talks facilitated by the United States and Saudi Arabia meant to yield a permanent ceasefire. They will originally agree, leading only to more violence in the region. The streets of Khartoum lie empty and desolate. Residents remain locked inside their houses as the battle between the country's army and paramilitary rapid support forces rages on. Despite a brief respite due to a ceasefire over the weekend, shelling and deadly fighting picked up again minutes after it ended. On the outskirts of the Sudanese capital, the town of Omdurman came under heavy artillery. Nothing was spared, like this house's facade damaged by shelling. The ceasefire agreement allowed civilians in the capital to buy food and medicine, but with stocks running low, residents struggled to find essential supplies. Emergency services are also inaccessible. The Red Cross reports that only 20% of hospitals are still working. The conflict broke out on April 15th, displacing almost 2 million people, with at least 450,000 seeking refuge in neighbouring countries like Chad and Egypt. The UN estimates the fighting has left 25 million people, the equivalent of over half of Sudan's population, seeking humanitarian aid. Welcome back. For more news, let's take it on the world in a minute. Beatles member Paul McCartney says that a new and final song by the world-famous band has been completed with the help of artificial intelligence. Speaking in an interview, the 80-year-old musician said he used the technology to extricate the voice of late Beatles frontman John Lennon from an old demo. John Randy, the man regarded as Cameron's champion of democracy, has died at the age of 81. He became a hero to many in the 1990s for his bravery at taking on the one-party state that brutally dealt with those challenging its rule. A US judge granted the Federal Trade Commission's request to temporarily block Microsoft Corp's acquisition of video game maker Activision Blizzard and set a hearing next week. A Chinese naval training ship arrived in Manila, its last stop of a regional friendly tour, amid growing unease over China's maritime activities in the South China Sea. The vessel named Xi Jinping is a giant training vessel 
are larger than a typical destroyer. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi arrived in Nicaragua, marking his second stop on a three-nation Latin American tour. The Iranian leader had a welcome ceremony at the Non-Aligned Square in Managua, where he was received by Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega. The leader travelled with his wife and delegation made up of ministers and officials. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We end off tonight's broadcast with a look into the digital exhibition, Sea of Mirrors, as it immerses Rio de Janeiro's residents in the beauty of nature and the universe through mirrors. Thanks for watching. Have an amazing rest of your evening.